Should I start? I'll start. I'll start now. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Indian Society of Emergency and Cardiac Nurses, I would like to welcome you all to the International Emergency Nursing Webinar Series. It's our second webinar in this series. This time we would like to focus on oncological emergencies. Few days back only we have celebrated World Cancer Day. I hope many of you have already attended various sessions on this year World Cancer Day theme, Close the Care Gap and Realizing the Problem. As we know that cancer is the second most common cause of death in our population and the oncological emergencies are the most common cause of death in cancer patients. Today's webinar will be focusing on various common oncological emergencies and I hope that you will be benefited from these sessions. With this note, I would like to invite Madam Ms. Smida Das, Associate Professor, College of Nursing, Ames, New Delhi, for welcoming the gathering officially. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Matthew, uh, and uh, a very good afternoon to all of you who are present virtually. And it gives me immense pleasure and uh, honor to welcome all of you on behalf of the Indian Society of Emergency and Cardiac Nurses to, uh, to this wonderful and uh, you know, very relevant um, uh, webinar that is on oncological emergencies. First of all, I would like to uh, welcome our chief guest, Mrs. Prathepa Joseph, who is a distinguished personality in the field of oncology nursing. She is presently working at Tata Memorial Hospital as an associate professor, and she's also, a pres also the president of Oncological Nursing so uh, Association of India. We welcome you, ma'am, uh, and thank you so much for, for sparing time uh, from your busy schedule. Uh, I also welcome all our proficient and intellectual speakers from across the globe. Uh, who have consented uh, to join us and enlighten us about um, oncological emergencies and its management. And as uh, Matthew has very well said that cancer is the, uh, considered to be the emperor of all maladies, um, as it is one of the most feared and dreadful disease as is, uh, and according to WHO, uh, it is considered to be the second, uh, um, you know, a second la largest cause for um, for death all over the all over the world. So, um, and the most sorrowful thing is that patients suffering with cancer may develop uh, emergent uh, clinical uh, situations due to uh, due to cancer per se, or sometimes as a complication of the therapy, which is usually termed as oncological emergency. And oncological emergencies are common uh, medical emergencies. Uh, and uh, because it is uh, sometimes its uh, symptoms are very subtle and it is sometimes ignored or, you know, overlooked by the healthcare professionals contributing to increase, you know, mortality and morbidity. Um, and the healthcare professionals should therefore be aware of uh, these emergencies, its uh, clinical manifestation and its ma management. So without wasting much time further, let us begin our intellectual journey through the virtual uh, mode and um, gain maximum in the you know coming three hours uh, of fruitful presentations and discussions at last I would like to conclude by saying one of the one of my favorite quotes that uh, let's hope that in future cancer only remains uh, a zodiac sign uh, thank you very much and uh, um, and thank you uh, thank you very much and welcome to this uh, session thank you thank you ma'am and now we are entering to the official inauguration ceremony of our webinar. This time we have very, very special guests from Tata Memorial Hospital, one of the largest and best cancer center in the world, Madam Pradeepa Jagadish. She is a very well-known oncology nurse leader, researcher, administrator, and teacher in our country. It's my pleasure to introduce Madam Pradeepa Jagadish to this webinar. Madam has graduated from Madras Medical College and did her master's from Maharashtra University of Health Sciences. Currently, she is pursuing her PhD from JJT University. She is working at Tata Memorial Hospital since 1991. She, has, she is the current national president of Oncology Nurses Association of India. It is the largest professional association of Oncology Nurses of India. She is a board member of AONS, that is Asian Oncology Nursing Society. She has organized many oncology 
nursing workshops and conferences nationally and internationally. She is also a research guide for MSc Oncology nursing students. She, is, she has published more than 30 papers. With great pride, I would like to welcome Madam Pratibha Jagadish to this webinar. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Matthews. That was very interesting to note uh, the, uh, the affiliations which has been present. It was very nice. But I am also humbled by the Indian Society of Emergency and the Cardiac Nurses that you have included me to be a part of this program. Very humbled. A good afternoon to all of you and uh, Smita and Matthew who have been a part of this journey. And I find that Matthew was a very uh, active person who's engaged in organizing this workshop. So this uh, emergency and cardiac nurses have shown their focus towards the oncological emergencies, which was such a good thing. Because oncological emergencies is something different from the other emergency setups, which we have seen. So what's the difference between an oncological emergency and other emergencies is that there is something called as a time, which means the time here in this oncological emergency is something very slow when you compare with other conditions. In all the other conditions where it is an emergency condition, it is very acute in nature and the patient or the family members doesn't have any time being given to think about such things. But whereas in an oncological emergency, the pathophysiological conditions are such that, that it gives us little more time to think about it. It is just not very acute in nature. So there is something called as the time, which means the time to develop the pathophysiological or the oncological emergencies are little delayed. Except for the neutropenic conditions, in all the other conditions, it takes a little more time for us. So what happens to the nurses? Here the nurses are given time to have little more assessment. Like there are various criteria and tools which have been given so that it gives us the a nurses to time and see whether these patients or who are all the patients who are at risk of or predisposing to such oncological emergencies. So it takes us time to evaluate these patients and go. Another time which has been given for us, the nurses, is that there is some time for the improvement of the patients. Like I can say the neutropenic conditions or in any other conditions, such the patients can be given some amount of food, some amount of herbal conditions, some amount of supplements such as honey. And these says that we can mitigate the conditions to a certain extent or the degree of suffering can be lessened. So I feel here in oncological emergencies, the time which is being given to us, the oncology nurses, is little more. So we can best utilize this time. In this time which has been specified, I would like to take the advantage of telling all the nurses who have been present online or who are not present in all these nurses, you, the nurses, have got the time and opportunity now so that your knowledge and comprehensiveness and the competencies can be increased. I just would like to tell a small story about it. Matthews, I'm not taking time. I'm just a, a two minutes time. So what happens is there was a boy, it seems, who was working in a shop who was about 25 years old. And uh, when he was working in the shop, he was not a good doing of works at all. The shop owner was very much angry with him for not carrying out the works. But this boy was very reckless and he was not doing any work. So he did not prove his competency at any time. And at one point of time, he died due to some unknown reasons. So a friend of him came and asked the shopkeeper, my friend has died. So he must have left some vacancy in your shop so that I can join. Can I join your shop as a worker? So the shopkeeper said, no, your friend did not leave any vacancy for us to say that 
he was working in this environment he did not he was not an asset at all for this institution so i just would like to say that all the nurses who have been here utilize this time and increase the knowledge and competency level i congratulate the indian society of emergency and cardiac nurses for organizing such a workshop here and matthew smitha and everybody else who are behind the screen for organizing and providing this workshop i also would like to take this opportunity to tell about the oncology nurses association of india or otherwise it's called as the onai the onai has around uh, more than 1800 like members and the there are four chapters to that we do have something called as indian journal of oncology nursing which is a voice for many of the oncology nurses so when these oncology nurses can speak in the indian journal of oncology nursing so it has got a good editorial board and matthew is a member of the editorial board so i'm telling to all of you to become the member of this association and to take the benefit of it only on becoming a life membership you can produce your articles here so there are many publications and this is going to be an iss number ordinated uh, the way the journal and i say to all of you to use this opportunity so hence i say that this webinar is inaugurated officially henceforth thank you thank you ma'am thank you so much for your kind words um it's our pleasure to join with you again in the future too ma'am and now let's begin the scientific sessions and the first session will be dealt by madam miss jida titus she will be taking the session on hematological emergencies and madam uh, madam jida titus uh, she is a post graduate oncology nurse from all india institute of medical science new delhi currently she is working as a registered nurse from Nap napian hospital sydney australia over to you ma'am thank you uh, matthew for this kind introduction um i hope i'm audible yeah yeah thank yes, you yes, so without much uh, delay i would like to start my presentation on oncological emergencies uh, it's uh, i also like to share say that it's really a joy and privilege to be a part of this webinar so let's start with the session so as we know today we are dealing with uh, oncological emergencies and uh, how is oncological emergencies defined it is a clinical situation in which the condition is secondary to a malignancy or the treatment of the malignancy and where there are potentially immediate catastrophic consequences in the absence of successful intervention so it's very clear from the definition that it is a direct consequence of either cancer or the treatment of cancer and if immediate interventions are not done uh, it can be fatal that's why it's classified as an emergency there are different types of oncological emergencies like metabolic emergencies hematolic hematologic emergencies and structural emergencies there are other sub classifications as well today uh, for me i'll be discussing with hematological hematological emergencies mainly uh, febrile neutropenia and neutropenic sepsis uh, this can also be classified as infectious emergencies uh also there is another classification which says that they are infectious emergencies so let's start with the case scenario so we have this um, young person presenting to the ed mr z uh he is has presented with fever of 101 degree fahrenheit chills irritability fatigue and cough so this patient he was discharged about 10 days ago after induction chemotherapy for the treatment of uh, blood cancer leukemia his complete blood uh, cell count reveals pancytopenia which means um there is um decrease in uh, all the cells so uh, decrease in wbcs thrombocytopenia and anemia and then we can see that there is a decrease in the absolute neutrophil count and it is less than 500 cells per microliter so uh, this is what he is presenting with so when you come across a situation 
uh, as a nurse, what do you think? What could be the most possible diagnosis? And what is your next step as a nurse? Um, this is something we, I would uh, want you to think about that whether this is an emergency and do you think it requires immediate attention? So let's learn about the condition and then you will be able to decide for yourself whether this is an emergency or not. So right now we are dealing with febrile neutropenia. So the word itself indicates what it is. Febrile, the, pa the pa person is having fever and neutropenia is low um, um, neutrophil levels. So it is one of the most common oncological emergency that is related to uh, chemotherapy. Uh, the disease burden is so high that more than 50% of deaths associated with cancer is um, associated with like um, associated to febrile neutropenia. So you can understand the significance of this condition, especially the deaths that is mainly uh, associated with leukemia, lymphoma, and solid tumors. So immediate recognition of this uh, condition and immediate initiation of antibiotics can save the life of the person. So just like stroke or um, uh, cardiac arrest, you can say that this is as important uh, to treat a febrile neutropenia. So how does um, the Infectious Disease Society of America define um, febrile neutropenia? Febrile means the, the temperature, a single oral temperature of more than 38.3 degrees Celsius or 101 degree Fahrenheit or um, two temperature reading, which is taken consecutively and which is take, uh, separated by just one hour. And the temperature reading should be more than 38 degrees. And also the patient person should have neutropenia with an ANC count of less than 500 cells or an ANC count that is expected to decrease to 500 cells per microliter of blood during the next 48 hours. So this is how we define. These two things are very essential to diagnose febrile neutropenia. The patient should have fever and the patient should have low neutrophil counts. So let's see what is ANC. We all know that neutrophils are the first line of defense against pathogens, like when foreign um, pathogens infect uh, the body the neutrophils, more neutrophils are produced uh, in order to fight against these pathogens. Neutropenia is a condition in which there is less number of neutrophils in the blood. And what is absolute neutrophil is, uh, it is a formula wherein you incorporate both the mature neutrophils as well as the immature band of neutrophils in the WBC. So there's a formula that you can see, it is uh, um, like the WBCs is multiplied with the percentage of polymorphoneutrophils uh, polymorpho plus the immature bands and it is divided by 100. So in a normal person, the normal ANC count is more than 1,500 cells per microliter or per millimeter cube of blood. So based on this, we have categorized neutropenia into four different categories. Mild neutropenia is when the patient has neutrophil count between 1,000 to 1,500. Moderate is when it is between 500 to 1,000 cells per microliter. Severe is when it's less than 500. The person is very much prone to infection because they have so much less capacity to fight. And profound is when the uh, neutrophil count is less than 100 cells per microliter. This is very important because the disease severity and um, the prognosis can vary depending on how much is the neutrophil count. So what are the causes of neutropenia? Why do these cancer patients have neutropenia? As we know, mainly like chemotherapy, the drugs uh, mainly affect all the rapidly dividing cells. And uh, cancer, the basic uh, uh, idea is all the cancerous cells are rapidly proliferating cells. So chemotherapy, uh, uh, chemotherapy mainly affects all the proliferating cells, but it can't distinguish which are healthy ones and which are cancerous ones. This causes um, a decrease in blood cells, which are very rapidly proliferating cells and causing a decrease in all the levels of cells. Like we saw in the case, there was thrombocytopenia, anemia, and low WBCs. So um, we expect that when a patient is on chemotherapy, the WBC counts will decrease. And for each drug, it is different. So uh, there is a prediction where we say, 
that uh, the patient will experience a nadir, uh, which means the lowest neutrophil count after a certain chemotherapy. And the patient should be aware of this because at that time they are the most prone to infection. That's why we need to know these terms, what is ANC, what is nadir, when a person is going to have nadir and uh, what is the implications. The result uh, of having an ANC is potentially life-threatening infections, which can be bacterial, fungal, or viral in origin. Mainly it's bacterial though. So who are at low risk for severe infections? As you can see, if the patient is having neutropenia for less than seven days, or if the neutropenia results in less than 10 days, we can say that they are um, not prone to very high infection. Then if there is um, no intravenous catheter if we can see there is any signs of bone marrow recovery, or if the person is also, also somebody who is in remission phase of malignancy, we can think that the person won't be much uh, affected but we have to be very careful. And there are, there are a few other things as well, as you can see in the slide. So how do we diagnose this condition? So as in any diagnosis, the first thing is history. We need to take a detailed history uh, about what is the underlying condition? Is the person on remission phase or uh, did he have a recent transplant? What is the transplant status? What, when was the last date of chemotherapy? Whether the patient is already on any drugs like steroids or is already on some prophylactic antibiotics? Um, we can also look at the transfusion history because many times when the blood cells are low, the patient can get some sort of transfusion, which can also um, increase the risk of infection. And then we can see if the patient is having any indwelling lines or catheters um, and ask for the history of, I mean, we can observe for the symptoms and signs. So these are the clinical features. It's very important to remember that many times they might not even have uh, much symptoms because inflammatory reaction is less. Uh, there's less neutrophils, inflammatory reactions are not produced uh, enough. So there might be people who might come with like mild symptoms or no symptoms, but we can still diagnose them based on fever and ANC count. But there are some people who might present with symptoms. So if you look at this person, uh, like fever, chills, Orally, like the person can have mucositis. If you go down, so what happens many times the normal endogenous pathogens of our body itself become uh, like um, infectious. Uh, so if you look at the elementary canal, the abdomen in the uh, intestinal area, there can be proliferation of all those cells causing intestinal tifilitis. Um, so it's, the symptoms can be related to all these things like orally, it can be mucositis. Um, if you look at the vital signs, the patient can have fever, tachycardia, hypotension. Um, and as you go down the system, uh, if it is affecting the lung, the patient can present with a cough or shortness of breath. Um, and any, if the patient has any catheter or, or all those sites, a uh, very high uh, chance of infection is there. So you have to look at the catheter, like IV uh, intravenous sites, uh, central lines for any uh, tenderness, any redness. Um, um, unusual vaginal discharge. So there's a lot of symptoms, changes in level of consciousness. All these things are um, different symptoms that we can look out for. I believe that by the time the patient has altered level of consciousness, it's really late. Um, so we need to uh, detect it as early as possible and initiate treatment as soon as possible. So as we have already discussed, we look at the oral cavity, the lungs, the abdomen for tenderness, the perineal area. It's very important with the perineal area. Uh, there is, we won't do any invasive um, activities like rectal examination or pelvic examination because these uh, factors can result in infection. So uh, we won't do anything, just uh, examination like, um, uh, uh, and then for the skin, uh, we look for bone marrow aspiration sites for any tenderness, any redness, vascular catheter sites, tissues around the nails. We look for any sim signs of uh, symptoms of rashes uh, on the patient um, that can be a source of infection. What are the investigations that can be done in a clinic? So uh, as a baseline, we do the complete blood count. Uh, and then the blood count can be repeated every three to four days to see how the patient is progressing. 
Then we look at the electrolyte levels, um, the urea creatinine levels. We do have to do a blood culture. So if the patient has central lines, we try to take blood culture from both the peripheral as, as well as the central uh, lumen sites. Um, it is important that uh, this should be done before the initiation of antibiotic um, treatment. Uh, and um, the other thing that we, we will be discussing is how soon the antibiotic should be started. It should be started in at least within 30 minutes in case of severe uh, infection and at least within one hour if the patient is presenting with mild symptoms. Then we also do a sputum culture or urine culture based on symptoms like if we suspect UTI, if patient has dysuria or um, frequency of urination or fever related to that. We do uh, urine culture, sputum culture if the patient has cough. So based on what the patient is presenting with, we do all the uh, investigations. If the patient has a drain, we will do a culture on staining of the drain side uh, fluid. Um, then radiologically, we can do a chest X-ray. These are not like mandatory, but based on the symptom presentation again. Um, for uh, abdominal, um, uh, if the patient has diarrhea and vomiting, we do an ultrasound of the abdomen to uh, rule out any uh, enterocolitis or tissulitis. So what are the treatment? As we already discussed, IV antibiotics is one of the mainstay of treatment, and that has to be commenced uh, within 30 minutes. And uh, the, if the patient has presented with like hypotension and things, we have to maintain the BP, we might have to transfuse fluids. And uh, again, with antibiotics, it can be oral or IV. Uh, we will be discussing how we decide on which antibiotic to start. And then uh, you might, I don't know whether we are aware, there is a factor called a granulocyte colony stimulating factor, which helps increase the neutrophil levels. Uh, basically, it is not, uh, recent evidence suggests that we don't uh, start a GCSF as a, like a routine thing. It is only indicated in uh, very severe cases, like if the patient had a hematopoietic cell, uh, stem cell transplantation, uh, for such patients, we might give GCSF. Otherwise, studies have proven that doesn't have much uh, added benefit with, re with regard to mortality. So the oral antibiotics that we give is usually, um, which is given to the patients is usually oral ciprofloxacin uh, and amoxicillin or flavonamate uh, augmentin. Uh, with regard to IV therapy, uh, it is mainly, as we discussed, it's only high-risk patients with pay, uh, we, we, and they will require inpatient admissions. Antifungals are not started straight away. It is only started uh, later on. Uh, and mostly uh, the most common antifungals given is amphotericin B, uh, fluconazole, and itraconazole. Uh, antivirals are generally not recommended unless we actually detect a viral infection. So the mainstay is antibiotics. Uh, so how do we decide? There is a risk assessment that has to be done. So when the patient is presenting uh, to the ED, there's a risk assessment done and based on that, the treatment is commenced. So when you do the risk assessment, we first look at neutropenia. If it is for less than seven days, the patient is at a low risk. More than seven days, the patient is at a high risk. Then cancers like solid tumors, lymphoma, myeloma are at a lower risk than acute leukemia. Again, severe sepsis, if the patient has no symptoms of sepsis, lower risk, but if they have present with symptoms of sepsis like hypotension, tachycardia, tachypnea, fever, um, and chills, rigors, and so many other things, they are at a very high risk. Uh, we look for site of infection. If there is no identifiable site of infection, they are at a lower risk than the other patients. Uh, then we also look for comorbidities like COPD or anything. And if that is present, they are high risk. If not, they are low risk. And there is a CIS scoring called MASCC scoring. Uh, based on this also, we can classify the patients as low or high risk. I will discuss what is MASCC soon. So if they are low, low risk patients, we can decide that they can be started on oral therapy. So if they can be started on oral therapy, we also think whether they can be treated as outpatient or inpatient, because mostly if it's oral therapy, they can be treated as outpatients. High risk patients, definitely, they have to be given intravenous antibiotic therapy and we will, they will be reassessed in three to five days. 
So what is the MASCC scoring system? So these are the characteristics. There is 21 points. So if the burden of febrile neutropenia is um, uh, like the patient is presenting with no symptoms or uh, no or mild symptoms, they get a five point. If there is no hypotension, they have they score five. If there is no COPD, it is four scoring. If the patient has hematological or like a solid tumor or hematologic malignancy with no previous fungal infection, they score a four point. If there is no requirement for a transfusion of fluids, they score three points. Burden of febrile neutropenia with moderate symptoms, they score three points. If there is outpatient status, like the patient, it is a no, it is not a nosocomial infection, or it wasn't acquired in the inpatient setting, they score three points. And if age is more than sixty, this is two points. So this is a scoring system that has been established. So if the patient's a patient is scoring less than. 21, they are at high risk. And if they are scoring more than 21, they are at low risk. So once we decide whether they are high or low risk, we can uh, decide on the treatment. Uh, the doctors decide on the treatment. Uh, so firstly, we after sending the culture, they are usually started on a broad spectrum antibiotic like piperazolin, tasobactam. Uh, to Brazil and Tazobacum, which is Tazac mainly in India, I believe. So um, uh, the reason is because we want to cover both the gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. The most common gram-negative bacteria is usually E. coli, Pseudomonas, and Klebsiella like of type of um, bacteria, and gram-positive is Streptococcus and Staphylococcus. So if you are aware of what is the most common um, presentations, like in our hospital, if mostly patients come with positive, I mean, the doctors can uh, kind of have a better clue. Uh, then uh, the, if the patients are clinically stable, they are given, they, they can also be given like cefepime or ciprofloxacin. Um, in patients who have, so this is like a three-stage Thing. So if the patient has a severe systemic compromise or sepsis, uh, are on high risk cancer treatment and have been inpatient, so they are like high risk, uh, they will be given an additional treatment. So the first one was just monotherapy with a single antibiotic. The second one, when they are classified as high risk, they can be, uh, they can be given as a dual therapy where an addition of aminoglycoside like amikacin or gentamicin is done. Again, if they have any renal problems, uh, they have it has to be reconsidered. Then, uh, if the patient is already who who is uh, resistant to uh, the normal antibiotics, like um, then we can they they can be considered uh, for the addition of uh, vancomycin for especially in patients who have methicillin resistant Streptococcus aureus colonization. So and and patients who are hemodynamically unstable again uh, unstable um, again the addition of vancomycin is considered. This is just for our general knowledge to know that what are the usual antibiotics that are needed. So. So as we already discussed, after three to five days, um, there will be again, they'll be reassessing and the, if the etiology is identified, just the directed treatment is given towards the etiology uh, to treat what is the condition. But uh, it is said that the broad spectrum antibiotic needs to be continued. We just don't discontinue it. But if the etiology is not identified and the patient is not febrile, um, uh, and if it is he, he or she is low risk, just continue the antibiotic or if it is an IV antibiotic, they can be changed to oral amoxicillin clavulinate. If the patient is still high risk, but are febrile, they continue with the same treatment when the etiology is not identified. And even after three to five days, if the fever is persisting, um, we, um, if the etiology is identified, continue the targeted treatment and uh, antifungals are added like amphotericin B, fluconazole, etroconazole. So we also have to look for any sources of new infection or any super infection if they have developed resistance to treatment or if there is any new viral or fungal infection. So it, what do you think? What it, can we do a profile access for a febrile neutropenia? Um, what is the recent research says? It is believed that antibiotic profile access is not a routine thing for antibiotic because of the fear of antibiotic resistance, except for uh, patients who are prone to PCP, that is pneumocystic carne and uh, They can be given trimethoprim sulfamethasone. 
And if patient um, is prone to fungal infection, especially in patient with hematopoietic stem cells transplantation, they can be given fluconazole. And again, uh, antiviral acyclovir or gancyclov is given for patients who have undergone allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. So prophylaxis in general is not a criteria. It is based on the personal situation of the patient. What is the nursing management? This is our one of the main thing, identification and nursing management. So in nursing management, of course, uh, most important when the patient is getting uh, chemotherapy, we educate the patient about a few things like what is neutropenia? How do you, um, what is, when are you expected to have an order or what is the time when you're most susceptible to infection? What are the things that you have to do to prevent infection? How to monitor temperature? And then there are neutropenic precautions that need to be taken at home. And what are the signs that you have to look out for? Like fever, chills, if if you have any symptom, report to the hospital immediately. Then um, we will be discussing what is the neutropenic precautions at home. So mainly I have just, just for easily to remember, we educate the patient for certain things. And then there's few things that we as nurses have to do like neutropenic isolation, or I would say reverse isolation and plan of nursing care. Nursing care of a neutropenic patients is very different. So the main idea, idea is that um, we will be putting on the gown, mask, gloves, um, um, even like um, all the basic PP so that we don't give infection to the patient because they are highly susceptible. Uh, so like uh, placing the patient in an isolation room, if possible, they have to be kept in a negative pressure room. The room is not like they might have only one visitor who is following all these precautions. We try to do all the nursing procedures together so that we don't enter the room time and again. So there are certain things that we can do um, to prevent infection. So all those things have to be be taken care of and there is something called a neutropenic diet is the diet that is given to these patients who are at high risk because even eating raw vegetables raw fruits can uh, cause infection in these people so uh, what is the neutropenic precautions at home basically these are very simple things but because of lack of knowledge and awareness the person the people can be infected so it's very important that as nurses we educate them give them all these basic things uh, that you know that they can do for example keeping themselves very clean washing hands uh, like even people who are taking care of the neutropenic patients need to wash their hands before and after touching the patient uh, they have to avoid any sick patients, anyone who has cold, even the mildest of flu, don't let, don't have so many visitors coming over to the house during such periods. Uh, so, you know, avoid sick people, avoid people who are vaccinated, especially people who have live vaccines, because these people are more susceptible. Avoid animals, prevent constipation. Why? Why do we prevent constipation? Because when the pe people strain it, um, uh, strain it, um, uh, the stool, they have, they can have rectal uh, area, like it can become sore and become infected. So they have to, we have to encourage them to drink more fluids and have a good fiber diet. Um, then they can, they have to avoid plants. And if at all, they have to get into the garden, they have to use gloves. Uh, don't use tampons because they can cause life-threatening bacterial infections. Take good oral care, like brushing the teeth morning and evening. Use of skunk screen to protect the skin because that's a first um, defense mechanism. Uh, so any, any scratches in the skin can be life-threatening. We can't imagine in a normal situation, but these people are susceptible to so much more infection. So if they have any catheter, like most of our patients have chemotherapy, CVC lines and stuff. So they have to make sure that it's very clean and dry. Avoid cuts and scratches. So don't use sharp things if possible. And if, if you have to use it, uh, have the extra protection for that. Avoid dental work. That is something very important. We tell them don't have any dental work during these periods and ha don't have any vaccine. So these are like very basic things that we tell the patients. Uh, and as I already explained, neutropenic reverse isolation and neutropenic diet. So neutropenic diet is mainly um, the 
stress on um, diet, like you know, the patients have to have cooked fruits and vegetables. If they have to eat raw fruits, it should be like um, a grapefruit, uh, like the big, uh, the orange, the ones that we can peel and eat like banana, uh, but rest of the fruits, it's basically steamed and cooked properly. Um, then uh, no sharing of food. Uh, and then like so, so many dietary precautions that need to be taken. Uh, they shouldn't be eating any half cooked uh, uh, meat or meat products, uh, uncooked um, egg or egg, egg products. Then even with milk, the milk has to be pasteurized. Uh, so a lot of extra precautions need to be taken uh, done uh, when they have their diet. Um, uh, so these were the main things uh, that uh, I had to discuss about febrile neutropenia. Uh, now we'll discuss what is neutropenic sepsis. Neutropenic sepsis is basically an extension of the febrile neutropenia where the condition has become life-threatening. Um, uh, the neutropenic sepsis is potentially a life-threatening complication of the neutropenia. And uh, how do we diagnose it? It is again the same. Uh, febrile, the patient is having a temperature of more than 30. Uh, signs and symptoms of sepsis like a low urine output, tachypnea, tachycardia, mental confusion, all these things um, help, uh, help us understand that the patient is progressing to sepsis. So the sepsis again has um, different divisions based on how they are presenting. So we all know that SIRS uh, is the inflammatory reaction to infection. Uh, so we, uh, uh, the symptoms are uh, either high temperature or low temperature. So even hypothermia less than 36 degree is uh, important because there is um, vasodilation and the per peripheries are cold and the patient can present even with hypothermia in sepsis. So both hyperthermia and hypothermia is important, tachypnea, tachycardia, and a WBC count of more than 12,000 or less than 4,000. So sepsis is diagnosed when the patient have either two symptoms of SIRS and a documented or highly suspected chance of infection. And severe sepsis is when there is um, evidence of end organ failure, like uh, the urine output is less than 0.5 ml per hour, uh, per kg per hour. So it, they are progressing to renal failure or the patient is having shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, they are progressing to respiratory failure. So based on symptoms, if they show symptoms of end organ failure, we, are say they, we say that they are already in severe sepsis. And septic shock is when now, so in sepsis, we try to resuscitate them with fluids, try to increase the perfusion, try to uh, improve the cardiac output by giving them vasopressors. So in spite of all these measures, if the patient is not improving, if the, the patient is still progressing to end organ failure, we say that the patient is already in septic shock. So these are the levels of uh, neutropenic sepsis. As they progress, they end up in septic shock. So um, who are the patients who are most at risk of septic shock as patients who are already um, very elderly or very young, like more than 65 or less than one year old, patients who have had uh, steroids already on immunosuppressive treatments, patients who have splenectomy, they don't have enough uh, help available. So uh, advanced malignancy, prior history of neutropenic sepsis, patients who have indwelling catheters or breaks in the skin or mucous membranes, malnutrition, previous antibiotic use and invasive procedures and patients who are hospitalized. There is a very high risk of them um, going into neutropenic sepsis. So as nurses, we are all aware that sepsis kills. So what can we do? Very easy to remember three things, recognize, resuscitate, and refer. So we have to identify, recognize that this is a sign of sepsis. The patient can very easily move on to septic shock. So we have to identify and start immediate treatment. So the resuscitation starts with IV and fluids and IV antibiotics as clinically indicated, and then refer them to the specialist. What is the mainstay of treatment? Just in brief, um, the time is running out. So we have antimicrobials as we have already discussed, fluids. So fluids can be crystalloids or colloids. The studies indicate that there is no uh, more efficiency of 
colloids or crystalloids. Uh, if we go, give colloids, the blood pressure and things can improve, but long term it's not as efficient. So even crystalloids fluids can be given. Uh, then use of vasopressors like norepinephrine, dobutamine can help, especially if the patient has cardiac instability. They prefer uh, use of dobutamine more than dopamine to increase the blood pressure of the patient um, and increase perfusion. Then a use of CPAP or BiPAP, non-invasive ventilation for patients who are uh, having going into respiratory depression. Um, then we have to prevent um, um, end organ damage and we have to also monitor for signs and symptoms of end organ damage. Uh, and um, the renal replacement therapy or hemodialysis if indicated and use of a balanced nutrition. This is what I can do or say in very short that these are the main of treatment of patient with sepsis. The take home message is uh, effective education of those people at risk of febrile neutropenia and neutropenic sepsis will assist in highlighting the symptoms they should self monitor so that they can report as soon as possible. They have to do all the things that can help prevent the neutropenic sepsis. And the most important thing, early detection and intervention frequently makes the difference between living and dying in an oncological emergency. With that, I would like to conclude. Thank you so much once again for this opportunity. Over to you, Matthew. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a few more questions. Few, few questions are there. Uh, yes. One Miss Kamalesh Thakur is asking, is it possible to reduce absolute neutrophil count to zero? Um, I, I really don't have much idea about this. Uh, maybe there is a possibility, but I will have to refer to that and see if there is an absolute possibility. Yes, actually, I would that like is, to... That is not what, what our intention is. Uh, our intention is to increase the neutrophils. So actually, uh, we can do certain things to increase the neutrophils. Like uh, it is said that if we eat balanced nutrition, especially eating high protein diet, which is properly cooked, can Im improve neutrophil levels. So our intention is not to decrease. Our intention is to increase. We work towards that. Uh, I think maybe there is something like that, but I'm not very sure of uh, helping the absolute neutrophil count going to zero. Uh, I would like to add, I would like to add actually a absolute neutrophil count can be uh, reduced to zero, but it's not in normal condition. When we are going for bone marrow transplantation, so after the conditioning therapy, ANC can be become zero. Uh, so that's a condition. Okay, uh, one more question. Um, this question is asked by Ms. Sapna Pal. She's asking, what is the full form of MASSC? Oh, yeah. MASSC is um, Multinational Association of Supportive Care in Cancer. So okay. it's an association of different um, specialists. They come together and they have suggested the scoring system to decide um, the, the risk stratification. Yeah, the risk of patient. So it's Multinational Association of Supportive Care in Cancer. Okay, thank you, ma'am. One more question. Uh, this question is asked by Indra Grace. She's asking, is neutropenia is seen in all type of cancer or which, which kind of cancer has high risk for developing neutropenia? So um, mainly blood cancers, uh, leukemias, lymphomas, and some of the solid tumors have a very high chance of neutropenia. Uh, basically, neutropenia will be seen in patients who have chemotherapy, but the extent of neutropenia is more in these patients who are hematological cancers and uh, some si so type of solid tumors and also in patients who have had stem cell transplantations. Okay, um, another question from Ms. Nirmala Kom. She's asking, don't we use injection septriaxone? Yes, I think um, I haven't mentioned all of them, all the antibiotics. I have mentioned only the main antibiotics. It, it always depends on the institute's policy, uh, what they use. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. Only the most important ones. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much for your informative you. session. And uh, I'm happy to share that around 650 um, participants are watching our session in YouTube live. And thank you participants um, for asking your questions, sharing, because these questions will make our session more interactive and active. And uh, we are moving to the next session. Um, that next session will be deal by 
um, Mr. Nasim M. Sir, he will talk about the metabolic metabolic emergencies. Uh, I would like to introduce sir to the, our webinar. Uh, sir is working as a nursing tutor at Institute of Nursing Science and Research, Malabar Cancer Center. Uh, it's an autonomous institution under government of Kerala, and he was graduate. He was graduated from um, PGI Chandigarh in medical surgical nursing with sub speciality of oncology nursing. Uh, currently, he is pursuing his MPhil from Manipal College of Nursing, Karnataka. Formerly worked in MIMS College of Nursing, Calicut, and Rufaida College of Nursing, Jamia Hamdad, New Delhi. He is Associate Editor of International Journal of Nursing and Midwife Research. He has published various research articles in national and international index databases. And he has also presented various scientific papers in national and international conference. Also served as resource person in regional and national conferences. With great pride and joy, I would like to welcome Mr. Nasim sir to this session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Matthew. Let me share my screen. Is that okay now? Put on slideshow. Okay, these are my slides. So that is in our slideshow. I think now that is visible. Is that okay? Sir, it's still in the, uh, not in the slideshow more. I think. Shall we, shall we share the slides from our end? Matthew, I will share from my side. That will be more better, I think. Okay, okay. I think uh, the slide, uh, I already put it in now, um, sli uh, slide share more. Okay. So shall I proceed like this? Because okay, sir. Okay, sir. Please, please excuse our delegates because there is a, some technical problem. So, sir is not able to put his slides on slide share mode. So, the the inconvenience caused deeply regretted. Sorry for the inconvenience. Thank you. Please, sir. Please continue. Okay. Is that moving now? It's not moving. Please move it. Yes, I'm moving. No, sir, it's not moving. But can you? Just wait, just wait. Uh, Nasim sir, ah, yes. uh, I think we can we can sort it out later. I think okay. we are moving to the next speaker. After that, we can continue, sir. Okay, fine, fine. fine. Okay, so Sami ma'am, I think you are ready there. Uh, 
So, my mom, are you there? Mattis, can you hear me? Can you yes. share the slide from myself itself? Sure, sure, sure. One, one minute, ma'am. Let me introduce you. Uh, dear participants, sorry for the technical delay. So we are moving to the next session. And this session will be dealt by Madam Miss Saumya TL. She is a postgraduate nurse. She is currently working as a senior nurse in Department of Critical Care at Sultan Qaboos Comprehensive Cancer Care and Research Center, Muscat, Oman. And she will be talking about the structural uh, oncological emergencies. And she will be mainly focusing on the spinal cord compression and superior vena cava syndrome. And uh, over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Matthews. I'm very humbled to uh, receive this opportunity from the um, Indian Society of uh, Emergency and Cardiac Nurse Nurses. I'm very thankful to you, uh, Matthews, for uh, offering me such an opportunity. Without uh, more wasting time, I will go into the topic. So uh, regarding, uh, we have already discussed about some hematologic, hematologic oncologic emergencies. Now we know that emergencies in the cancer patient may occur because of the effects from the tumor expansion, metabolic or hormonal effect mediated by the tumor products, as well as by the treatment complications. An oncologic emergency is defined as a clinical condition, which is resulting, uh, resulting from the metabolic, metabolic, neurologic, cardiovascular, hematologic, and infectious or caused by the cancer or its treatment that requires immediate intervention to prevent the loss of life or quality of life. The Oncologic Nursing Society has classified the oncologic emergencies, emergencies into three broad categories, that is the metabolic emergencies, structural emergencies, and urinary emergencies. The structural oncologic emergencies are caused by the direct compression of the non-tumor structures or metastatic disease. The most common structural oncologic emergencies or the obstructive oncologic emergencies are metastatic spinal cord compression, superior vena cava syndrome, cardiac tamponade, raised intracranial pressure, as well as the malignant pleural effusion. So today we will be discussing about the metastatic spinal cord compression and superior vena cava syndrome. So regarding the metastatic spinal cord compression, it is a complication of cancer. Usually it presents as an oncologic emergency. In this, the cancer grows into the bonds of the spine or in the tissues around the spinal cord and cause pressure on the spinal cord. And this may result in the permanent neurological deficits like paralysis or loss of bowel and bladder control. It may occur due to the collapse of damage to the vertebrae, pressure of the tumor on the spinal cord or spinal metastasis. Moving on to the incidence of about 3 to 5 percentage of the all cancers we will develop metastatic spinal cord compression and of the all advanced cancers 15 percentage contribute to this uh, disease and regarding the site uh, it is commonly seen in the thoracic spine region and it is about 60 to 70 percentage and then next to it is in the it is seen in the low lumbosacral region it is about 20 to 30 percentage and it is less commonly seen over the cervical spine region and it is only about 10 percentage then moving on to the risk factors, the best breast cancer is the uh, one which contributes most to the metastatic spinal cord compression and it contributes about 25% each. Then is the lung cancer, it contributes about 20%. Same like lung cancer, the prostate cancer is responsible for the 20% of metastatic spinal cord compression. Then is kidney cancer, it comes around 10% and then the multiple myeloma as well as the lymphoma contributes to 10 to 15% of the metastatic spinal cord compression. Then regarding the pathophysiology, as I told, it, is, it, occurred, it occurs due to the compression around the spinal cord. So because of this compression, 
there will be reduced blood supply because of the vascular compromise and the venous stasis there will be production of the inflammatory mediators like uh, interleukins prostaglandin and this again leads to the vasogenic edema because of the vasogenic edema there will be reduced blood supply and will be responsible for developing the neurological deficit even when the neurological deficits are not treated or we are not doing any interventions it probably it will lead to the ischemia because of the ischemia there will be anaerobic respiration and uh, there will be surge of amino acids these amino acids are usually the excitatory amino acids like glutamate and uh, aspartate this uh, will increase the toxic level and usually within 15 minutes of injury the toxic level increases as a result again there will be cytotoxic edema and there will be opening of the calcium calcium channels and which contributes to the activation of phospholipases and the proteases as well as phosphorylases in the cells and this contributes to the apoptosis as well as demyelination and the permanent damage of the spinal cord next regarding the clinical features the most common or the red flag sign of the spinal metastatic spinal cord compression is the back pain and the back pain may be either a new back pain or unexplained one and the characteristics of back pain is it is radiating in nature and it uh, that means it spreads down the leg lower back buttocks and arms and also if the patient feels like a band is around the tummy or the abdomen or the chest then the another characteristics of the pain is uh, it get worse with the movement straining like uh, lifting something heavy or while coughing and sneezing and also usually the pain is worse at night and it is also worse it also worsens with the uh, recommend position or the lying down position the next is the neurological signs the neurological signs may be pin prick sensations or numbness then they also presents with unsteady gait then bowel and bladder dysfunction it may be either constipation or incontinence and there will be sensory loss usually the sensory loss is observed one or two vertebrae below the site of compression and next is the uh, next and last is the limb weakness there may be limb weakness or spasticity and the reflexes there will be hyperactive reflexes like babinski's reflexes etc then regarding the diagnosis actually the gold standard uh, diagnostic measure is the mri then ct then if there is uh, any contraindication for mri or ct we may go on to myelography then the goals of the treatment are to relieve pain and other symptoms to protect the nerves so the normal body functions such as bowel and bladder control or walking are not affected and also to prevent the permanent disability so for the drug therapy we are uh, we are giving corticosteroids as well as chemotherapy but the uh, drug of choice is corticosteroids and in that is dexamethasone in dexamethasone usually it is given at a dose of 16 mg or 80 mg with along with the uh, proton pump inhibitor usually uh, pantoprazole or esomeprazole then uh, the uh, high dose uh, corticosteroid is then tapered off when the symptoms get re gets relieved usually this uh, corticosteroids are given to reduce the swelling uh, around the uh, swelling and pressure around the spinal cord and also it gives quick relief from pain next is chemotherapy in the chemotherapy is indicated only for the cancers um, that are sensitive to chemotherapy like non hodgkin's lymphoma then hormonal therapy as well as chemotherapy are given after radiotherapy for breast and prostate cancer some some may also prescribe prescribes the bisphosphonates like solidronic acids to reduce the breakdown of the bone then is surgery surgery is done uh, to uh, for the stabilization as well as debulking of the uh, tumor so uh, for surgery there are some contraindication if the patient has been already been uh, irradiated sometimes there may be skin breakdown or infection from the irradiated side in the, in those cases surgery is contraindicated so if anyone is preferring to do surgery for this and also a radiation therapy then it is preferably to, to do the radiation therapy after surgery surgery is done to remove as much as of the tumor as possible and to stabilize the spine as well as to relieve the pressure within the spine next is decompression laminectomy in decompression laminectomy a section of the bone is removed from one of the vertebrae to relieve pressure on the spinal cord and the nerves so the prognostic indicators 
which are suggesting this patient is more likely to have a surgery is that uh, first one is a histological evidence or so histologic finding suggests it is a cancer of breast, uh, multiple myeloma, prostate, renal cell carcinoma, myeloma or a lymphoma. The other prognostic indicators are good a patient who is presenting with good motor function, limited comorbidities, single level spinal disease, absence of visceral meds and a long interval from the primary diagnosis. Then next is the radiation therapy. In radiation therapy, usually external beam radiation therapy is indicated for this metastatic spinal cord compression. In this, um, the single fraction treatment that is about 8 gray in a single treatment or a daily treatment up to 2 to 4 weeks. This 8 gray into 1 week is given either in 2 weeks or in lymphoma and multiple myeloma. It, it can be gone up to 4 weeks. Then, uh, regarding the NICE guidelines, that is the National Institute for Health and Excellence Guidance 2008, they have advocated the local cancer network pathways for the rapid diagnosis, treatment, rehabilitation, as well as the ongoing care of patients presenting with metastatic spinal cord compression. They recommend that the patients at high risk of developing bone metastasis or those who are diagnosed with meta bone metastasis should be informed about the signs and symptoms of the metastatic spinal cord compression and uh, what to do if any symptoms develops. For this, if the patients who are uh, presenting with spinal pain, which is suggestive of metastasis, and with a diagnosis of cancer, they have to do an MRI spine, MRI whole spine within a week. And if a patient with the signs of metastatic spinal cord compression, um, is an, is, it is a medical emergency and the urgent whole spine MRI should be done within 24 hours. So this is an algorithm regarding the NICE guidelines. And so when it is confirmed, definitive treatment is uh, advocated and the definitive treatment is surgery followed by radiotherapy and then radiotherapy as well as palliative care. Regarding the care of this patient's metastatic spinal cord compression, I told you that the patient will be resulting, and at last the patient will be resulting with some neurological damage. Sometimes there will be sensory loss. So there will be complications of loss of sensation, paralysis and immobility. So nursing care should focus on uh, first of all, prevention of uh, the complications of immobility, then uh, complications like uh, prevention of DVT, in that we should uh, advocate them to use the DVT stockings. Some patients will be put on to the um, low molecular weight heparin. Then uh, measures, should be uh, measures should be instituted to prevent the uh, formation or development of the pressure ulcers. So that was regarding the uh, metastatic spinal cord compression. Next, moving on to the superior vena cava syndrome. Superior vena cava syndrome, it is a group of symptoms which occurs as a result of the obstruction of blood flow through the superior vena cava. You know, the superior vena cava drains all the venous blood from the upper, upper trunk, head and neck. So, regarding the etiology, uh, it, uh, superior vena cava occurs when a tumor in the chest which presses this superior vena cava, then a tumor which grows into the superior vena cava and blocks it. And when a cancer that metastasizes to the lymph nodes around the superior vena cava, and when there is a formation of thrombus within the superior vena cava. Usually in the uh, lymph nodes, testicular cancer and esophageal cancers metastasize to the lymph nodes around the superior vena cava. Regarding the clinical features, the clinical features occurs because of the obstruction of the superior vena cava and reduced venous return from the head, neck and upper extremities. And this may result in the swelling of your face, neck, upper body and arms. Trouble breathing or shortness of breath, then coughing, uh, swollen veins in your chest and neck, then swollen arms hemoptysis, tachypnea, skin looks blue, especially the lips, then uh, the arms will be edematous. These are the clinical features of superior vena cava syndrome. Next, the diagnosis. How can we diagnose this um, superior vena cava syndrome? With the physical examination itself, we can see uh, the, if the patient is presenting with uh, superior vena cava obstruction because the patient's upper body will be edematous and the lower body will be normal. So in physical examination, you know, we can see dilated neck veins, increased collateral veins on the anterior chest wall. Then in CT, then next is CT scan. 
then x ray is also done in chest x ray there will be widening of the superior mediastinum and there will be about 25 percentage of uh, right sided pleural effusion then mri venogram then transesophageal echocardiography usually this transesophageal echocardiography is done to diagnose the vena cava thrombi then uh, regarding the treatment the treatment depends upon the severity of symptoms etiology and prognosis and the goals of the treatment is to relieve symptoms attempt cure of the primary uh, cure of the primary malignant process and in us um, uh, like the uh, unlike the uh, metastatic spinal cord compression in this uh, superior vena cava syndrome usually it will be mild usually it not it will not present as an emergency unless it is an emergency there is no there should there not there should not there is no need of immediate intervention so for that we will give supportive therapy supportive therapy or supportive care includes the elevation of head end of the bed to decrease the hydrostatic pressure and thereby the edema then if uh, we told that in clinical features the patient is will be presenting with dyspnea or shortness of breath and this may leads to hypoxia and if there is hypoxia oxygen administration can be done either can be done to the nasal cannula or through the face mask then we know the fluid is overloaded and to reduce the fluid fluid overload and remove it from by the kidneys we will administer diuretics like a furosemide then to reduce the inflammatory response or infl inflammation we will administer glucocorticoids it will reduce the tumor burden in the lymphoma and thymoma which is likely to reduce the obstruction usually dexamethasone is also administered here then moving on to the chemotherapy the uh, anti neoplastic therapy is the definitive treatment for this um, superior vena cava sin obstruction syndrome and then it is also in, it is indicated in lymphomas germ cell tumors small cell lung cancers etc then regarding the radiotherapy radiotherapy is indicated for the radio sensitive tumors like hodgkins disease thyroid cancer etc usually 3000 to 5000 centigrade is advocated of this 300 to 4, 400 centigrade is given for the first two days and then 150 to 200 centigrade daily until the total doses given next is endovascular stenting um, to remove the obstruction inside the uh, superior vena cava this endovascular stenting will be done it is usually done uh, percutaneously by an interventional cardiovascular specialist the potential adverse effect of this uh, endovascular stenting is that it may contribute to the pulmonary emboli hemorrhage pericardial tamponade stent malposition as well as the recurrence of superior vena cava syndrome so there is also another complication for the endovascular stenting that is a transient congestive heart failure a transient congestive heart failure can develop because there is a rapid return of the venous blood into the heart after the stenting procedure then thrombolytic therapy is also uh, indicated in this svcs so in this we will administer streptokinase and urokinase the streptokinase and urokinase is only advocated if the symptoms occur within 7 days and the patients at risk of thrombus further thrombus formation should be uh, continued on anticoagulant drugs like warfarin or heparin then regarding the nurses role Uh, in this uh, both uh, structural emergencies the nurses role is recognition of the high risk patients then facilitation and coordination of the diagnostic procedures assessment of respiratory and cardiac respiratory cardiac and neurologic systems then administration of therapy you know we have already discussed that these patients will be receiving chemotherapy radiation therapy as well as surgery so the measures which are to be uh, taken for uh, surgery that includes pre operative nursing care post operative then post operative excess post operative um, nursing care as well as rehabilitation is also a mainstay for the nurses then uh, regarding the chemotherapy we have to advocate uh, we have to um, give the post post chemo uh, nurse nursing treatment like measures to prevent the neutropenic sepsis and the complications of chemotherapy then uh, regarding the um, radiotherapy also the nursing care should be focuses on delivering uh, pre a uh, post radiation treatment then provision of emotional and psychological support is also an important um, 
important or uh, it is it is the most it is a cornerstone of this uh, nurses role in um, uh, superior vena caval syndrome as well as the metastatic spinal cord compression and also we know that patient education is the uh, important thing next to conclude despite all the improved cancer care classic oncologic emergencies con continue to occur and many requires icu management cancer therapies have evolved with more focused tumor targeting however complications and side effects are not necessarily limited and unique emergencies have been identified although overall survival from cancer has improved patients are commonly admitted to the icu at some point during their clinical course therefore it is crucial for the intensive care nurses to have a working knowledge of the common oncologic emergencies and novel therapy related complications as they are more likely to be seen in everyday clinical care practice and by this this i will end this session over to you matthews thank you ma'am thank you so much for the elaborative informative session on uh, structural oncological emergencies uh we have a couple of questions from the audience um, the first the first question is what is apoptosis it's question asked by mr lokendra apoptosis is the programmed cell death usually because of the reduced blood supply because of hypoxemia and ischemic changes the cell death occurs and also because of the release of some um, enzyme the cell gets um, the cell uh, cell dies this is known as apoptosis Uh, and second question, it is not directly to our our topic. Still, Miss um, Saumi Pal asking, how much chance that recurrent disc prolapse after micro discectomy can lead to mal malignancy? Is there any chance to develop malignancy after micro discectomy? She is asking. Actually, uh, I don't think that uh, discectomy may leads to any cancer. cancer has some other reasons or if the patient is having some history or familial history it may contribute unless i don't think that it will contribute to the development of any cancer in the spine or something like that okay i hope that uh, the miss saumi pal got some clearance okay uh, by this we are concluding the second session we are moving to the final session of the day uh, that will be covered by um, mr nasim <laughs> ahmed Uh, he will be talking about the metabolic emergencies and he mainly focus on the tumor lysis syndrome and hypercalcemia over to you sir okay thank you matthew so apologies for the technical glitches that happened in between the uh, program no problem so anyway uh, in this uh, technological era we have to face that um so first of all i would like to express my sincere gratitude to the organizers of this international webinar international indian society of emergency and cardiac nurses for inviting me to deliver a talk on this uh, metabolic emergencies so let us start so we can proceed to the next slide so if we talk about the emergencies in patients with cancer it may fall under three categories maybe that may be one group that is the pressure or obstruction caused by a space occupying lesion so maybe the growth of some tissues so basically cancer is the uncontrolled proliferation of the cells then similarly the second category uh, otherwise it may fall into the emergency may be due to the metabolic or hormonal problems basically it plays with the physiology of the human body so including the paraneoplastic syndromes then the third category that may be the treatment related complications so these are all the three uh, uh, groups in which the patients with cancer uh, if they are uh, developing any kind of any sort of emergency so it may fall under these categories now let us see what are the emergencies in oncology so oncologic emergencies that we can categorize into structural emergencies that is already discussed by my previous speaker then similarly the hematologic emergencies that is also discussed now the last one is that is the metabolic emergencies that we will see today so uh, among the metabolic emergencies there are so many uh, conditions like the adrenal failure that is the failure of the adrenal glands to respond very well similarly the hypoglycemia then cr means syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone and fourthly hypercalcemia of malignancy and tumor lysis syndrome that is also termed as tls so these are all the various metabolic emergencies so i would like to start from 
the bottom that is the tumor lysis syndrome. So let us talk about the tumor lysis syndrome. Next slide. So uh, how we will define the tumor lysis syndrome? So from the word, from that term itself, it is very clear, tumor, lysis breakdown. So some kind of syndromes that is appearing in the patients because of the breakage of that cancer cells. So Howard has defined this TLS as an oncologic emergency in which large numbers of tumor cells are rapidly destroyed and spilling their cellular contents into the systemic circulation and potentially resulting in serious complications which can manifest as electrolyte abnormalities. So the, this definition clear, give a clear cut idea about what is tumor lysis syndrome. So here what is happening because of some of the treatment, so like chemotherapy or radiation. So because of that, what is happening, the tumor cells are destroying. So if the cell is destroying, uh, so automatically the content inside the cell will be coming into the uh, extracellular fluid. So here it will be draining into the blood. So that as a result, what will happen, there will be some elevation of some of the blood components, uh, some of the electrolytes in the blood. So as a result, it can uh, make several kind of complications in our target organs, various organs in our body. So this is basically what is happening with the tumor lysis syndrome. So proceeding to the next slide. So this, when this tumor lysis syndrome can occur, so usually it can occur within six hours of cancer therapy initiation. If a patient had undergone chemotherapy, maybe within next six hours, this TLS can uh, arise. And similarly, nowadays we have a wide, broad array of uh, 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 different drugs and different therapies for the treatment of cancer. So that also exhibits some sort of tumor lysis syndrome. Next slide. Now, uh, what is the incidence? Uh, so how, uh, so regarding uh, the different kinds of tumor, which are the common tumor in which we can see the tumor lysis syndrome. So non-Hodgkin lymphoma, among that the Burkitt type lymphoma, Burkitt lymphoma, that is the very most common lymphoma in which we can expect tumor lysis syndrome because it is highly sensitive. Then similarly, this TLS is very common in acute lymphocytic and lymphoblastic leukemia as well as in acute myeloid leukemia. And if we talk about chronic leukemia and multiple myeloma, here the tumor lysis syndrome will be very less common. And among the solid tumors, the CA breast, CA lines, this tumor lysis syndrome will be very rare. Now regarding the etiology, so uh, what are the reasons? So uh, uh, from the definition itself, it is clear that this is because of some kind of uh, treatments. So usually the TLS can occur spontaneously or after the anti-tumor interventions like chemotherapy, radiation, or any other kind of uh, therapies, uh, treatment measures which are using for the treatment of the cancer. And similarly, there are some specific chemotherapeutic agents. So those, those patients are receiving these kind of chemotherapeutic agents. So of course, in such kind of patients, we can expect tumor lysis syndrome. Examples, paclitaxel, tax and derivatives, then hydroxyurea, etoposide, and the fludarabine. So IV or in the intravenous or intrathecal administration of these drugs can lead to tumor lysis syndrome. It is already, uh, uh, several studies already reported, uh, these drugs are more prone to get tumor lysis syndrome in cancer patients. Then similarly, another procedure that is called post-transcatheter arterial chemoembolization. So this is also one of the technique for the treatment uh, for the liver cancer. Then radiofrequency thermal ablation. So all these will lead to the dis uh, destruction of the cells. As a result, the cell content, uh, especially the cell contents can come out into the blood and it can uh, affect, uh, it can make some alteration in our body physiology. Moving to the next slide. So what are the patient comorbidities which contribute to the development of uh, TLS? So some sort of comorbidities. So if any cancer patients are having these kind of comorbidities, of course, in that such kind of patients, they are vulnerable for developing this uh, tumor lysis syndrome, like chronic kidney disease, oliguria or acidic urine, then dehydration or insufficient fluid resuscitation. So the dehydrated patient. Uh, then exposure to nephrotoxic drugs like vancomycin, aminoglycosides, then similarly some of the contrast agents uh, for diagnostic purpose. So we are familiar with some of the contrast iodine-based dyes that we are using for the CT scan and MRI. 
then splenomegaly, uh, splenomegaly, the enlargement of the spleen, that could be the another comorbidity in which we can, uh, in which the patient is more prone to get the TLS, then extensive lymphadenopathy, ascites, history of hyperuricemia or hyperphosphatemia. Hyperuricemia means elevated level of uric acid in the blood or ele uh, hyperphosphatemia, elevated level of the phosphorus in the blood then some kind of mutation to the tumor. So basically any mutation happen to the tumor, of course, there will be chance for apoptosis. That is already somebody asked in the previous session that will lead to the program cell death of their, uh, 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 the, uh, apoptosis is the program cell death. As a result, the cell can die. So these kind of some of the mutation can lead to the destruction of the cell. So all these will contribute to the development of TLS or tumor lysis syndrome. Now, what are the four major metabolic abnormalities? These are responsible for the clinical manifestation of tumor lysis syndrome. So, uh, uh, the following uh, uh, features that can that may occur individually or in combination, like hyperuricemia, hyperkalemia. Hyperuricemia, I already said, that is the elevated serum uric acid level. Then the hyperkalemia, that is the elevated potassium serum potassium level. Then hyperphosphatemia, the, that is the elevated phosphate level in our uh, blood, then hypocalcemia, the reduced, the decreased level of serum calcium in our body. So these are all the four metabolic abnormalities we can see that is, ex uh, that is uh, appearing as a manifestation uh, after the tumor lysis syndrome. Then the severity of these metabolic alterations like hyperuricemia, hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, and hypocalcemia, these alterations that is related to tumor burden and the renal dysfunction because kidney is having a great role in our excretion. So several electrolytes that is excreting via kidney according to the need of our body. So kidney is doing a great role in that. Next slide. Now the pathophysiology. So uh, uh, here the systemic effect of TLS occurring early and age in the disease, how it occurs. So in this uh, slide, you can see at the middle, you can see the cancer cell. So cancer that is already, uh, I already told you that this is the uncontrolled proliferation of the cells. Now we have to reduce this uh, size, cells, uh, cellular size means we have to reduce the number of cells. For that purpose, for that purpose, we are using different me me mechanisms like chemotherapy, chemoembolization, so hormonal therapy, immunotherapy, radiation surgery, even the fever. So all these things can ha uh, can have some effect on these cancer cells. Basically, what is happening? So all these interventions like radiation, Im uh, immunotherapy, chemotherapy. So everything will destroy the DNA of each cell. So if anything happen that is the brain of the cell so if anything happened to that cell if any any damage that is occurring to that cell further there is no scope of life for that cell of course that cell will lead to the uh, apoptosis or the cellular death so that cell die means the breaking of the cells so as a result what will happen the cellular content the intracellular content will come out so where it is going so that is coming into the blood so as a result uh, uh, then one more thing we should uh, we should know that our cell is uh, intracellular the sodium the sodium is very less inside the cell when comparing with our extracellular area but potassium is very high inside the cell and potassium is very less in the extracellular area so during the breakage of these cells the content will come out so as a result the potassium that is in rich that is in the abundant inside the cell that is coming out. So as a result, there will be elevation of the potassium level in, in the blood. Similarly, the phosphorus is coming. So here you, we have to remember that the relation between the calcium and the phosphorus. If phosphorus level is high in our blood, automatically the calcium level will be going down because there is an inverse relation between this calcium and phosphorus. So if the calcium level uh, uh, rising in the blood, automatically the phosphorus uh, level will be going down. So they are in a inverse relation. So here from the phosphorus from the inside, from the intracellular area that is coming to the extracellular area. So the blood is now rich in potassium and phosphorus. As a result, what is happening? The calcium level will be going down. So that is why we are seeing that, uh, that uh, for metabolic abnormalities, in that you can see the hypocalcemia. 
And along with this nucleic acids, nucleic acids basically, so in the coming slides, you, you will get a more idea about this nucleic acids. So adenosine and guanine, adenine, adenine and guanine, these are all the nitrogenous compounds and it will be going for metabolism and it, that will lead to, uh, finally it will be converted into the uric acid. That is why the uric acid level is elevating in the blood after this uh, lysis of the cells. As a result, because of these abnormalities, elevated potassium, elevated phosphorus, and elevated nucleic acid contents in the blood, that will lead to, that will infect our various organs in our body, like the GI system will be disturbed, neurological system will be disturbed, cardiovascular system will be disturbed, renal system will be disturbed, as well as the neuromuscular system will be disturbed. As a result, what will happen? So we're we'll proceeding to the next uh, slide. So in this picture, the, the things are very clear. So because of the lysis of these cancer cells, there will be a release of intracellular content into the blood. So here you can see the nucleic acids. So DNA, so DNA, the adenosine and guanosine. So finally, uh, at the end of the metabolism, we are, we are getting this uric acid. Now all this uric acid is accumulating in the blood. Then similarly, the phosphate is accumulating in the blood. So at the same time, because of this elevated level of this phosphate, this calcium level will be going down in the blood. Then potassium, that is also uh, uh, elevating in the blood. Then here cytokines, and that will also damage the kidney uh, uh, through its mechanism, cytokines, these uh, uh, immune mediators, these uh, chem uh, chemical mediators will uh, cause hypotension. So that will lead to the low perfusion to the kidney that will cause some, that will put some kind of harm on the kidney. Similarly, that will also play a great role in the inflammation. So as a result, the kidney tissues will be destroyed or damaged that will end up with the acute kidney injury. So that is, this is the pathophysiology of the tumor lysis syndrome. Next slide. Now see how the systemic effects. So because of that process, because of the release of that intracellular content in, into the blood, what is happening here? So due to hyperuricemia and the accumulation of the toxins in the blood, as a result, GI system, our gastrointestinal system is uh, affected. So the early signs and symptoms will be nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, anorexia, fatigue or lethargy. These are all will be the early symptoms. And some of the symptoms will be developed late. That includes the hyperactive bubble sounds and abdominal crampings, along with the daily signs and symptoms. So these are all the various gastrointestinal effects of this tumor lysis syndrome. Next slide. And neurological uh, system, how it is dist getting disturbed because of the hypocalcemia, because of this hypocalcemia. So the early symptoms will be like restlessness, irritability, impaired memory. And the late manifestation will be the laryngospasm, carpopedal spasm, confusion, delirium, hallucination, papilledema, because there will be totally, because of this hypocalcemia, because of the low level of calcium in the blood, all these kind of um, uh, uh, signs and symptoms will appear. And how the cardiovascular system is affected? It is due to the elevated level of potassium, that is the hyperkalemia as well as the hypocalcemia. These two factors will metabolic abnormalities will contribute or will disturb our cardiovascular system. The early signs and symptoms will be hypertension, elevated BP, tachycardia, and ECG changes like prolonged QT interval and uh, in ST uh, prolongation, as well as the lowering and inversion of the T wave that can be detected in the ECG. And which are all the late complications? Similarly, ball T waves, hyperkalemia, one of the classical feature of hyperkalemia, then shortened QT interval, widened QRS complex, uh, then absence of T wave, then bradycardia, heart block, then uh, ventricular arrhythmia, asystole, and cardiac arrest. So these kind of uh, severe cardiovascular complications can arise in the late period. Now, the renal disturbances, how it occurs due to the hyperuricemia, hyperphosphatemia, and uh, obstructions, obstruction of the uh, 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 nephrons, the obstruction of the tubules in the uh, renal system. So that is due to the deposition of the salts like uric acid and all those things. So mild azotemia, elevation of the nitrogenous waste in, our, in the blood, then flank pain and oliguria and increased urine, urinary osmolarity. 
and in the late period there will be crystalluria so the urine will be turned into a cloudy appearance as well as if it microscopically examined then we can see so many crystal like substances in that then hematuria profound azotemia so in the beginning that was very mild now the azotemia is very profound then edema renal insufficiency and uh, anuria the absence of urine production then atn and acute tubular necrosis and finally that may be end up with acute or chronic renal failure moving to the next slide neuromuscular so what are all the neuromuscular uh, disturbances have happening so it is because of this hypocalcemia and the hyperkalemia so uh, the early signs and symptoms will be muscle weakness muscle cramps muscle spasm twitches muscle twitches and muscle irritability and paresthesia and which are all the late complications like severe muscle weakness muscle cramps spasm along with that ascending classic paralysis there is loss of muscle tone then positive presio and ghost like sign these are all the classical feature of the tetany so positive presio sign so uh, how we can elicit that presio sign so this is especially uh, we can see a patient who are suffering from hypocalcemia just attach a bp cup over the arm of the patient and inflate that bp cup to the uh, a level which is above their sbp for example if my systolic blood, blood pressure is 130 you just raise the bp above 130 maybe to the 140 and keep it for 2 to 3 minutes then if a patient is suffering from hypocalcemia of course there will be a Uh, carpopedal spasm on their wrist joint so that is the positive tracheo sign that kind of carpopedal spasm that is happening uh, the spasm that is occurring on the wrist joint so that is in the, that is a positive tracheo sign so that we can say the person is suffering from hypocalcemia then similarly the positive vostex sign vostex sign how we can elicit this vostex sign so this is especially the uh, a twitching of the facial muscles so uh, just tap the uh, nerves just tap tap it over the face in front of your ear so here you just tap it so here if you just tap it of course there will be twitching of the facial muscles so that indicate the positive vostex sign so these are all the classical features that we are seeing in hypocalcemia then tetany will be mani so manifesting then convulsions may be happen then acute articular distress may happen so acute articular distress means Uh, uh the joint uh, discomfort it can also develop so these are all the various uh, system disturbances which is happening because of this tumor lysis syndrome so everything is playing with our body physiology now this is for just your information this uh, tumor lysis syndrome that is classified so there is uh, so one of the most widely accepted classification is that was given by kero and bishop so the tls tumor lysis syndrome that you can uh, define laboratory tumor lysis syndrome or clinical tumor lysis syndrome ltls and ctls how we will define laboratory tumor uh, tumor lysis syndrome laboratory tumor lysis syndrome that we can define this uh, by looking into the uh, serum chemistry serum electrolytes uh, or the way uh, uh, serum electrolyte by just looking on the serum electrolytes we you are just defining whether the patient is suffering from tumor lysis syndrome syndrome so what is the criteria so ltls two or in ltls two or more of the metabolic abnormalities below present on the same day for example you got a cancer patient who have already received some of the treatment for the cancer now they you have to monitor these parameters uric acid potassium phosphorus and calcium so if you are finding any two of this uh, uh, abnormality like uric acid is greater than or equal to 80 mg per deciliter in adults or to the upper limits of normal in children and potassium that is greater than 6 milliequivalent per liter phosphorus greater than 4.0 mg per deciliter in adults or greater than 6.5 mg per deciliter in children and calcium that is less than uh, or equal to 7 mg per deciliter or the free calcium that is the ionized calcium that is 4.5 mg per deciliter so you are getting yeah, at least two uric acid or phosphorus you are getting that much level then you can say that is laboratory the patient shows some kind of uh, laboratory tumor lysis syndrome then one more so just just go back to the uh, previous one so one more here one more criteria is that these things should occur within 3 days before initiation of therapy or 7 days after initiation of the therapy 
then uh, based on these parameters, you can class categorize into LTLS. Next. The another one is the CTLS, clinical tumor lysis syndrome category. So for this, uh, you have to look at the clinical manifestation uh, on the patient. So LTLS, along with that serum chemistry, along with that lab parameters, uh, plus any one of the publication that is described here, like the patient is along with the LTLS, the patient is suffering acute kidney injury, then you can term it as a clinical tumor lysis syndrome. Or the patient is suffering from, symptom, suffering from symptomatic hypocalcemia or seizure or cardiac dysrhythmia or sudden death. So this everything can happen because of these metabolic aberrations or metabolic derangements. So that's about the uh, LTLS and the CTLS. I just shared for, uh, for just for your information. Now, what about the investigations? Of course, you have to concentrate on these four metabolic abnormalities. You have to mainly focus on the laboratory clinical findings. You have to constantly monitor the patients for uric acid, potassium, phosphate, and the serum calcium level. So uh, you, have, you, you have to concentrate on, on these four things. And apart from that, you have to take a detailed health history and physical examination because it will help you to find out some of the risky patients those who are prone to develop this tumor lysis syndrome. So you, have, you should have a record on the weight so that weight you have to monitor, then you have to say, record the nutritional and hydration status of the patient. Dehydrated patients, so if the patient hydration is very poor, then you can expect tumor lysis syndrome if that patient is uh, receiving any kind of cancer uh, treatments. Then past and, uh, you have to review the past and current medications then you have to review the history of chronic health problems, any kind of allergies and any kind of organ dysfunctions. So you have to rule out, you have to, you should have a, 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 a you should have a detailed record on all this uh, health history of the patient. Then similarly, you have to identify any kind of risk factors for TLS patients. So here I am giving some of the clues and what we can do. So some of the managerial part that also we are discussing here. So patients at a high risk, so who are at high risk? A patient is coming with a high-grade lymphoma, acute leukemia, pre-existing renal impairment, or elevated pre-treatment with uh, pre-treatment LDH, lactate dehydrogenase enzyme. So this enzyme will also give some kind of indication about the tissue destruction in our body. So, so these kind of, if you are getting these kind of patients, then you can categorize that patients at a high risk and that hospitalize that patients for the treatment. And similarly, you are getting some patients with the solid tumor, and we have seen that. So uh, this TLS is very rare in solid tumor uh, patients. So solid tumor, low-grade lymphoma, adequate renal functional, normal pre-treatment LDS. They are having a normal LDH before the starting of the chemotherapy or radiotherapy. So in such patients, you can categorize under them into a low risk group. So you can treat, they can come for a treatment on OPD basis or on the daycare basis. So there is no harm. So in that way, you have to categorize the patient. So the assessment skill, a nurse should have a very good assessment skill to rule out this uh, tumor lysis syndrome. Then uh, we have to closely monitor the lab following lab parameters before, during, and after the treatment, like serum potassium, serum phosphorus, serum calcium, complete blood count, platelet count, uric acid, blood urea, nitrogen, creatinine, LDH, urine pH and then specific gravity. So that will give you an idea about the status of the patient. Then similarly, you have to assess the GI function because we have seen the effects that uh, the various system disturbances, GI assessment, neuromuscular assessment, neurological assessment, cardiovascular assessment, and renal assessment must be done based on that lab parameters. Now, for, uh, coming to the management, how we will manage this tumor lysis syndrome? So, especially the identification of the high risk patient. You have these are all the management principles like identification of the high risk patients, initiation of preventive therapy, early recognition of potential complications, and prompt intervention to prevent or mitigate such kind of uh, complications. So, these are all the management principles. Moving to the next slide. The prevention, prevention. So prevention of tumor lysis syndrome, that is the primary goal. So uh, uh, that is the primary goal for the management of tumor lysis syndrome. So for that, what we have to do, we have to frequent uh, monitor the lab 
uh, lab chemistry, laboratory chemistry, and we have to frequently assess the renal functions and the careful assessment of the signs and symptoms associated with each metabolic abnormality that we have to do. So in the preventive aspect, we have to perform all these things. Next slide. Then similarly, you can start the aggressive hydration and diuresis so that it will help to eliminate several electrolytes. It will help to uh, remove many of the salts from our body. Then the treatment, prophylactic allopurinol that can be given to for the elimination of the uh, uric acid. Then another treatment, treatment suggested is the RAS uricase, that is for the prevention and treatment of hyperuricemia. Allopurinol that can also be administered. Similarly, RAS uricase that is also can be administered. Then alkalinization of the urine. So what is the rationale of alkalinization of the urine? So if you make the urine alkaline level so that the uric acid will be it will be diluted very easily so that it, it can eliminate through the urine. So that is the uh, rationale behind the alkalinization of the urine. So this picture, this how the allopurinol act in our body and similarly how the raspberry is acting in our body. So as a result of this adenosine uh, due to this purine catabolism, it will be converted into hyposanthine. And this sandine will be converted into sandine. Finally, it will be forming into the uric acid. So that allopurinol will break this conversion that will not allow the sandine oxidase to convert this sandine into the uric acid. So that this conversion, so that it will reduce the buildup of uric acid in our body. So what the rasp uric acid is doing, so this uric acid will be converted into a more diluent non-harmful product that is called allantoin. So with the help of uricase oxidase. So the raspberrycase, basically it will convert this uric acid into a non-harmful allantoin. So as a result, we, uh, the patient can be saved from the harmful effect of uric acid. So this is how this allopurinol and uh, this uh, raspberrycase is acting in our body. So the recommended dosage is 300 milligram per day and it can be reduced in 100 milligram per day after the three, three days of the chemotherapy. If raspberry acid is using 0 0.0 milligram per kg IV daily for five days, it has to be administered. Then you have to hydrate the patient with the half saline, 300 ml per day, 3000 ml per day. Then initiate chemotherapy within two to four every 12 to 24 hours. If no metabolic aberrations exist, if the patient is there in the normal range so that we have to uh, do on a prophylactic basis. Next slide. For example, the patient is manifesting with some of the metabolic derangement like hyperkalemia or hyperphosphatemia or any, so that they were hyperuricemia. So there, there also we have to continue the allopurinol or aspiric acid treatment along with the hydration of 5% uh, blood source water with two ampules of sodium, by, sodium bicarbonate and uh, non thiazide diuretics that can also be added. And urinary alkalinization, that also I already told you, just keep the, try to keep the urine pH of the patient more than 7.0 so that it will be, helps to eliminate the uric acid from the body as uh, easy, as easily. Then post on chemotherapy and then the uric acid has decreased and the electrolytes are stable. So this is very, very important if the patient is showing any kind of metabolic abnormalities that indicate the tumor lysis syndrome. Similarly, you have to closely watch the serum chemistry and you have to replace the calcium and uh, treat the hyperkalemia and hyperphosphatemia with the exchange of the six and phosphate binders. The conventional treatment modalities can be used. Next. Then this is the criteria for the dialysis. So this is, uh, this is also one of the last resort for the patient. So if the patient the para serum lab values are uh, are uh, going beyond this serum potassium is more than 6.0 milliequivalent per liter, uric acid more than 20 milligram per deciliter, and phosphorus, if it is about 10 milligram per deciliter, then the patient may be uh, suggested or the patient may be recommended for hemodialysis. Next. I'm going a little bit fast. Then the complications. We, we, well, what kind of complications that can arise in tumor lysis syndrome? Continued electrolyte disturbances can happen, renal failure can happen, uremic complications can happen, cardiac arrhythmia, then pulmonary edema because of the aggressive volume repletion. Because hydration, that is the primary treatment for tumor lysis syndrome. Next. Now we move on to the hypercalcemia of malignancy or hypercalcemia. So, next slide. 
So how we can define the hypercalcemia of malignancy? It is abnormally high level of calcium character for albumin that is greater than 10.5 milligram per deciliter. So mild, mild hypercalcemia can be the level between 10.5 to 11.9, moderate will be between 12 to 13.9 and the severe will be more than 14 milligram per deciliter. So in such condition, it will be termed as hypercalcemia of malignancy. This is the most common oncologic emergency if we talk about the oncologic emergencies. And 20 to 30 percentage of cancer patients at some point of time during the course of the disease, they might have, uh, uh, they might have faced hypercalcemia. Then this uh, hypercalcemia is more common in solid tumors like CABRA, CLN cancer, and multiple myeloma. And 50% of the patients who are, uh, who are with breast cancer and multiple myeloma, they are suffering from this hypercalcemia. And this hypercalcemia is widely associated with the, the bone metastasis as well. Then the detection of this hypercalcemia in patients with the cancer signifies a very poor prognosis. Approximately 50% of such patients die within 30 days. So that is one of the pathetic situation of hypercalcemia in malignancy. Excuse me, sir. Ah, yes. Sir, we are running short of time. Kindly conclude in ah, yes, minutes. Sir. You just... You just uh, uh, Yes, you can, you can conclude in 5 to 10 minutes, sir. Oh, okay. Yes. I will finish within 5 to 10 minutes. Then uh, these are all the various causes uh, uh, for solid tumors we have already seen. Then hyperparathyroidism, vitamin D intoxication, chronic granulomatous disorders, and some kind of medication that will also cause hypercalcemia of malignancy. Next slide. Then there are four types. I'm not going in detail. So you can just, uh, just for your information, I'm sharing the, the one type of group is that is local osteolytic because of the osteoclast activity in the body. So 20% of the hypercalcemia is contributing from this, this, type, of hyper, uh, this uh, type of hypercalcemia. Then 80% that is categorized under humoral, that is very common type of hypercalcemia of malignancy and along with the vitamin D associated hypercalcemia that is also there. Then similarly, some of the hypercalcemia that is associated with the ectopic production of hyperparathyroid uh, parathyroid hormone that is called the hyperparathyroid hormone. So anyhow, the humoral hypercalcemia is the very most common hypercalcemia. Next slide. So the, uh, this local osteolytic that you can see in CA breast, multiple myeloma and lymphoma and bone metastasis that is very common in this kind of local osteolytic hypercalcemia because of this osteoclastic bone destruction activity will be more, that is why. Next. Then the humoral hypercalcemia, this is because of the secretion of the release of parathyroid hormone related protein, a protein which is very similar to the parathormone. So as a result, uh, there will be hypercalcemia. So, uh, squamous cell lung cancer, head and neck, esophagus, cervical, renal, ovarian, endometrial, breast cancer, means all this uh, type of cancer can exhibit this femoral hypercalcemia. So, because of that protein. So, this is the mechanism, however, parathyroid hormone that is, uh, uh, that is um, working in our body. So, if parathyroid hormone secret in our body, kidney will, what the kidney will do? They will reduce the calcium elimination. As a result, they will retain the calcium in the body so that it will lead to hypercalcemia. So here the parathormone related protein that is also doing the same thing. It is activating the kidney. As a result, kidney is retaining more calcium. As a result, the blood will be accumulated with more calcium. Similarly, it activates the vitamin D. So vitamin D from the small intestine, it will absorb more calcium into the body. Similarly, the bone, there will be a bone resorption. So there will be the bone will release calcium into the blood. Finally, you will land up with the hypercalcemia. Next slide. So this is uh, uh, vitamin D. So uh, proceed to next slide. So this is uh, the ectopic hyperparathyroidism associated with hypercalcemia in malignancy. That is very, very rare. Next slide. So what are the clinical features? Hypercalcemia elevated serum calcium level. So mildly elevated serum calcium. So we will not show any kind of symptoms. So usually the symptoms will appear in a vague manner. And moderate uh, serum calcium elevation will lead to anorexia, polyuria, polydipsia, nausea, vomiting, and constipation. Sometimes it will show some kind of uh, features of the diabetic uh, malators, the classical features. Uh, so these uh, hypercalcemia sometimes shows the classical features of diabetes malator. So being a clinician, being a nurse, you have to clearly rule out whether the reason is due to the malignancy-associated hypercalcemia or the diabetes malators. 
then the more severe so that you can categorize this uh, next slide so that you can categorize this hypercalcemia under general neurological and gi so general thirst cold urea polydipsia dehydration weight loss lethargy fatigue pruritus cardiac arrhythmia neurological irritations manifestations like uh, confusion psychosis and coma and gi disturbances like anorexia nausea vomiting constipation and peptic ulceration next slide so diagnosis that is basically the serum uh, you have uh, we have to see the calcium level as well as the albumin 50 percentage of calcium in the blood that is uh, binded with the albumin and some of them are associated with the phosphate and the uh, calcium phosphate uh, so it is that is in the form rest will be uh, available as free calcium that is the calcium io so this is the uh, 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 so this is the status of calcium in our blood so you have to rule out all these things so if the albumin level is very uh, low, so that the free calcium level may rise because free calcium will be more there. So you have to check serum albumin calcium uh, bore to rule out this hypercalcemia associated with this malignancy. And also you have to exclude the uh, diabetes mellitus, the uh, features of the diabetes mellitus. So you have to clearly exclude because it shows some kind of classical features of DM. So what is the treatment? So the treatment basically focusing on restoring the intravascular volume, enhancing renal excretion of the calcium and inhibiting the bone resorption. So um, that is the, the focus of the treatment for the uh, management of hypercalcemia. So uh, that uh, treatment is with the normal saline and frusamate. Next. Bisphosphonate like palmitronate and zolidronic, uh, zolidronic acid. So that will help to destroy the osteoclast activity in our body. Next. Calcitonin. So calcitonin transiently lower the serum calcium level. So calcitonin that can also, also be administered for the management of HCM. Then corticosteroid that also helps to lower the calcium levels in patients with the steroid sensitive malignancies like multiple myeloma and lymphoma. So the mechanism just just previous slide. The mechanism of action that increase in urinary calcium excretion and decrease intestinal calcium abs absorption through the inhibition inhibition of one alpha hydroxylase enzyme. So that is basically happening with the corticosteroids so that it helps to reduce the calcium level in our blood. Now, what is the analysis role? So same like in the all other metabolic emergencies, prevention, the scope of prevention that the nurses has to think. You have to rule out all the things. We have to identify the risk uh, groups, then thorough assessment of the patient and early identification of these kind of emergencies. Tumor, you just identify the early manifestations then cross monitoring and continuous analysis of the lab chemistry uh, parameters then health education of the caregivers about the complications about the signs and symptoms of these kind of metabolic emergencies so that they will also be very vigilant it will helps to uh, admit the patient as early as possible for the management of this metabolic emergency so in conclusion hypercalcemia and this tumor lysis syndrome these are the two common oncologic emergencies that can occur in almost any patient with a malignancy and identification of risk to patient is critical to managing and preventing both oncological emergencies so being a nurse we should have a thorough idea about the physiology uh, and the disease progression of these two complications so that you can save or you can manage the patients very well thank you Thank you so much, sir. Such an elaborative, informative session. And uh, I think the, the feedbacks which we are getting in the YouTube is overwhelming. And thank you so much, sir. Such a wonderful session. So thank we you. have some couple of questions to discuss. Um, the question asked by Adriel Joby Manyali. The person is asking, can TLS lead to malignancy? TLS basically that will not lead to malignancy. Here basically what is happening that is breaking because of the DNA damage. Once the DNA damage further that cell will not survive. Of course that cell will die. So that that will not convert into any kind of malignancy. Okay sir. Uh, another question asked by Ms. Christina Samuel. How can fever leads to TLS? Is there any chance? I think Tumor, because of uh, uh, some of, because if our uh, fever that is due to several reasons. So there will be some cyto mediation can happen. So some harmful uh, chemical mediator can be released because uh, uh, if a person suffering from fever, of course there will be a release of so many uh, chemicals into the bloodstream, and similarly that can damage the cell. So that. Uh, that can harm the uh, uh, 
cancer and that can harm the cell so that that leads to the destruction of the cell okay thank you sir uh, another question it from it will be a trigger okay sir thank you so much another question from ms smita sunil uh, what is the condition when phosphorus level is decreased i think she is asking about hypophosphatemia uh, the relation the relation hyperphosphatemia uh, hypo 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 here basically hyperphosphatemia is if hypophosphatemia is happening so usually the uh, relation uh, in our uh, first of all we have to understand the relation of calcium and phosphorus in our body if the calcium level is rising automatically the body will the blood the blood amount of phosphorus will be going down if the phosphorus level is elevating automatically what will happen the calcium level will be going down so that is why in tumor lysis syndrome we are seeing because from the inside the cell the phosphorus is coming out as a result the level of phosphorus is elevating in the blood so that the calcium will be going down so where the calcium is going it is that is going into the bones okay thank you so much sir uh, we have some more question but anyway the time is over and thank you so much once again sir for such a wonderful elaborative informative sessions uh, i would like to thank the all the expertise who came here and took the uh, informative session for our um, uh, our audience i would like to specially thank our first speaker miss jida titus and um, miss saumya tl who talk about the structural um, um, structural emergencies and uh, mr nasim sir who talk about the metabolic emergencies i also would like to express our sincere gratitude towards our chief guest of the day madam miss pradeepa jagadish uh, who inaugurated our session earlier she was the uh, oncology nurses association of india national president and thank you ma'am for your valuable time and come and bless us on this occasion i would like to express my sincere gratitude towards the, our academic council chairperson uh, madam dr punam joshi ma'am uh, she is our advisor of academic council her guidance and support uh, make us uh, all our program more wonderful thank you ma'am i am also expect uh, extend my sincere gratitude towards the all our academic council members and our indian society of emergency and cardiac nurses uh, president mr shaukat ali uh, for giving us support and guidance uh, we have a, a big team of technical team behind this program uh, mr sajin abdul khader and mr famir sikh is continuously working on this on behind the screen and thank you so much for your endless support and we have also madam smita das associate professor college of nursing as well as she is our academic council member she only uh, introduced or welcomed our gathering officially thank you ma'am for your support and uh, i am i am seeing the endless support from the audience uh, we have around more than 6 700 plus audience in the sessions and you are your feedbacks i am seeing in online thank you so much for your support and thank you once again your support gives us energy to do such a uh, such types of webinars in futures too uh, before ending the session i would like to say some more general announcement you can you can fill your posters and feedback the link which you have already shared in the comment box it's active now it will be active for the next 24 hours next 24 hours you can fill your post test and feedback feedback form and you will get the certificate within 30 days of calendar calendar days within one month you will get it and when you are filling the form you have to remember that you have to fill the correct correct email address i repeat correct email address if you have filled the incorrect email address you won't get the certificates i repeat please be ensure that your email address and the name which you are filling in the form is correct that is very important and you have to also check your spam folder for the certificate sometimes it may not be in the main inbox it may be in the spam folder so please check the spam folder too and Uh, we used to conduct these types of uh, webinars uh, we are planning to have it in every month uh, and uh, your support is very important for getting the update from our programs you can subscribe our youtube channel so that you will get the uh, our updates so these are the some of the general um, guidelines or announcement i can share once again thank you so much once again the uh, post test link is active now 
it will be open till 13th that is tomorrow sunday 6 pm till 6 pm so you can fill it and uh, to get the certificate you should have at least 60 percentage of poster score at least 60 percentage of poster score is mandatory for example if you failed in the first attempt you can try again but it should be before uh, tomorrow 6 pm tomorrow 6 pm i repeat tomorrow 6 pm till that you can you can uh, fill the post test link as well as the feedback and please make sure that you are entering the correct email address correct email address and name thank you once again for your endless support and thank you so much thank you so much by this we are concluding thank you so much thank you everyone